So I spent 10, 12 days with Michael Jackson. What was that like? A bit of an eye-opener. Some stuff where people just start passing up. Yeah. Did you see a lot of that? His happen? fan base was huge. A lot of the fans had black taxis on the meter all day, just so they could jump into it whenever they want, you know, wanted to follow us. I worked with Bella for a couple of years. We'd just been to an event, just left there. We was in a Rolls Royce, she was in a ball gown, I was in a suit in London, and there was a free Palestine march. And she said, oh, I want to get involved. And I was on my own. So I said, no, thank you, let's not, you know. And she said, no, 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 I want to do it, I want to do it. I was close to possibly, you know, if she got out on her own, what do I do? I can't sit in the car. Comes about the watch yeah. theft. I mean, it's a bit of a pandemic, really. It's still quite bad. It's just maybe not reported on quite as much. It is quite common. And, and some of the gangs, they, they won't stop at anything. You know, they chop your arm off. It's just crazy. If it means they can take the watch. Two or three years ago now, there was a, there was a young man who got stabbed to death around the back of Howard's for his watch. There's, there's, there's a lot to go with it in this country as well, though, because it's not only police officers, all the prisons are massively overcrowded. We've is got, that right? We've got a number of prisons that aren't even fit to be prisons anymore. Really? If we had, all the, if we had an unlimited box of money to do it, it's still going to take you a good few years for it to slowly all filter through and be sorted out properly. Hello and welcome to episode 24 of the GV London podcast. Today we're joined by one of our clients, Simon Newton. Simon is a um, former bodyguard for the A-list celebrities all over the world, including Michael Jackson, Bella Hadid, Kendall Jenner, just to name a few. He's got a massive security company at the moment and he's also released his own clothing brand and also works as an actor as well. So thanks for joining us, Simon. Thanks for having me. Um, so tell us how it all began. Um, very long time ago. I, I live in London now, but I was born in Eastbourne on the south coast. Um, growing up, I was always into business. Um, even at a very, very uh, early age, I think when I was about eight years old, I started selling Donald Duck stickers, which was my first business. Mm -hmm. Uh, subsequently got shut down because there were stickers all over the school. Um, but f even as early as that, I knew that, you know, if you buy something and sell it for more than you bought it for, that's how, that's how you make money. Mm. Um, as I moved on there, um, I, I... Actually, just to touch on that, pretty much every single entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur that we've had down here, always starts with a similar kind of story. We just yeah. had, had somebody on last week that, that created this massive clothing brand. And he was selling stickers at school as well, right, so okay, right. you're not Maybe the only one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's kind of where it started for me at eight years old, I guess. As time went on, um, I joined the Army Cadets when I was 13, 14 years old, uh, which sort of led me on to wanting to be a soldier, really, in, and be in the military. When I was younger, all I ever wanted to be was a soldier. Really? Um, if you asked anyone else in the class and they wanted to be you know, astronauts, scientists, doctors, mm. all this stuff, I never wanted to be a soldier. Really? So I kind of knew I was probably going to get my dream job really because you know obviously there's a lot of people in the military mm. um so subsequently later on i left school uh i did an engineering apprenticeship for a small uh, period of time mechanical engineering apprenticeship and then i joined joined the military i've, I've joined reserve forces to start with if the royal signals okay so uh, what is that then the reserve force um so it's basically i mean it's all changed now because this yeah. is quite a number of years ago like 20 or five, 25 years ago. Mm. Um, you do evenings, weekends, two weeks away. You can p pick and choose within reason what you want to do. So it's more relaxed. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. more relaxed. And you normally have a civilian job as well at the same time. Um, but I wanted to be in the army. It wasn't really where I wanted to be. So I wasn't in it very long at all, really, before um, I went across to the regular army and I was posted to Canada. By the way, you keep on saying how much you wanted to be in the army. What, what, where did that drive come from? Um... I don't know, if I'm honest. I enjoyed army cadets, I think. Um, and I like the idea of travelling. I liked... I don't want to say I like the idea of war. Yeah. Um, but I did like the idea of being part of something, part of a team, mm. um, and just experiencing that environment, not just a, as a soldier, but like in, you know, in a wartime environment as well. I always wanted to experience that. Never really thought, obviously, at an early age, you don't think about what that might bring. Mm. Um, but yeah, I always wanted to experience the whole thing of going to war, experiencing war, uh, coming home from war. You know, mm. it's it's a whole different um, sort of bag of emotions what goes on with that. Obviously, some people don't come back, some people come back injured. Mm. Um, it's just an interesting But you time. had a drive to experience that? Yeah, I, I, that's really what I wanted. And that, at, at the time, I wasn't interested in business. Yeah. I was interested in that. That was my business, if you like, was to be a soldier. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so I was posted out to Canada. Yeah. 
Um, and this is after you left the reserves? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was out there for about 13 months at a British Army Training Unit Suffield. I believe it's closed down now, actually. But mm. it used to be the only place where you could a- exercise a full battle group of tanks and artillery, all live firing. Um, the, the training area is like huge. It's like almost the size of Hungary or something like that, I think. Really? Yeah, it's a massive one. In, in Canada? In right? Canada, yeah. So that exactly. British Army used to have a place out there where they could exercise battle groups at a time. So I, I was out there for just over a year working on the exercises. Um, then when I come back, I went to 209 Signals, which is in Catwick, and we went out to Iraq, 2003 um, mm. Iraq War, where that was my first taste of sort of being on operations, really. Mm. Um, well, uh, what responsibilities did you have? When you I was, uh, so I was in the Royal Signals, but I was actually with a, um, I was attached to a unit, um, an artillery unit called 473 Battery, where... Uh, some guys were put together to look after, um, I call them American diplomats, if you like. Okay. Um, and long story short, kind of the job was to take these two people out to various sites where a chemical, um, well, initially it was, it was weapons of mass destruction yeah. were. Yeah. Um, but it was more anything chemical, any sort of chemical waste or, or uh, munitions. Um, and I got put on that team to go out and do that. Uh, which was for me, it's like the best job I could have had. At, I, mean, really? I was 22 years old, 23, and uh, yeah, it's a great job did, for me. Did you have any close calls with transport um, at that time? So it's just at the end of the war phase, um, and it's a time where everyone, all the troops, US and British, kind of thought, okay, we're the war fighting's done now. You know, we're, we're good here, um, and we had maybe four or five weeks, as little as that relatively quiet period of time the job I had with them um, we was wearing civilian clothing um, wasn't really wearing body armour that often all our weapons were concealed um, but within five six eight weeks something like that we was back into uniform weapons were out because it just started escalating really uh, and, and actually there was a lot more people you know a lot more soldiers killed in the subsequent operations oh, really? after because everybody so. started relaxing yeah, well, yeah. just because the insurgency kind of got its act together and then started causing us problems. Wow. Um, there was a, sm- a small low in the battle, if you like, from when the actual war fighting ended. Mm. Um, and, and then um, all the different militias and different, you know, terrorist groups and everything else got together. Did you um, have any close calls? Uh, yeah, yeah, we had a few. I mean, in the early days, um, kids, the first sort of threats we had was kids smashing all the car windows with rocks. Oh, yeah. So that was kind of where the tipping point started. Yeah. Um, and it, at the time, we only we didn't have armoured vehicles, so that, that was happening quite a lot. Um, armoured vehicles are quite expensive. Yeah, they are, but it, we just didn't have, because it's just after the war, we, a yeah. lot of logistics and stuff, we just hadn't been shipped out there yet. Okay, got you it. wouldn't need armoured vehicles during the war, so yeah. it comes as in like civilian armoured vehicles, not military ones. Yeah. Um, so a lot of stuff that we needed after the war fighting phase hasn't really, hadn't really caught us up yet. So we was using whatever we could use. Yeah. Um, but subsequently, we then went into Land Rovers because it was it was far more safer to go into Land Rovers with you know top cover of guys with rifles and all the other sort of. Well, what what is the most driven vehicle? Because I I would have assumed uh, if if an army's got enough money, they'll ship out a whole load of G wagons or something. Yeah. Like that, no. Right? Well, um, Land Rover's been the been the military really? MOD go to for years. I keep hearing it's going to be changing. I don't know how true really? that is. Or, or maybe it has changed, but when I was in it, it was always Land Rover for the small sort of vehicles. Wow. Um, but on that job, I had um, GMC sort of... Mate, that's yeah, huge. Yeah, four, four by four. But yeah, because yeah. Cause we was looking after Americans, we, we was using their vehicles. Yeah. Um, so we had them, which were quite good fun to drive. They were quite you know big vehicles, automatic, yeah. which was always nice because the military ones were never automatic. Well, them posing, isn't it? You you know you're coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's big, so we used to have a couple of them, which was nice, but... Um, the British Army needed some um, for their own staff, mm. uh, and they actually. But I remember they sent out, I think it was two or three brand new Range Rover Vogues, and this is roughly probably when the Range Rover Vogue first ever come out, yeah. kind of thing. Um, and I remember looking. If you looked at them now, they look really old. But I remember looking at them thinking, "Blimey, they've come a long way. Yeah. They look really good." Three, two white ones, one silver one. I think they lasted about two weeks. Uh, no way. And we had to get rid of what, them. What happened to it? But just people smashing the windows again, oh, and, no. and just, you know, and they're all top spec, uh, you know, leather seat, everything you wanted in it. Mm. Um, and then it's just too dangerous to be in because they weren't armoured again; they were soft. Mm. So uh, yeah, so I did, I did that while I was out there. I bumped into a friend of mine in Basra Air Station. 
uh, and he was working for a private security company. Um, and he said to me, oh, because at the time I was in civilian clothes when I met him, he said, are you, what are you doing? Are you with? I said, I'm still in the military. He said, what are you doing with the military? He said, why didn't you come and work for his private security company? Mm. So I thought about it. Um, at the time, I was due to be, after that tour, I was due to be posted uh, to Katowick, and the unit I was working with gave me the opportunity to go on their selection yeah. process and stay with them. So I would have stayed with them after, you know, as a sort of a, for the rest of my career at the time. Um, so I was torn what to do. Do I go and do that or do I leave the army and go and do private security? And obviously, you know, the money and the, um, the accommodation and all the other stuff with private security was way better than what I was getting in the army. Mm. Um, so we went back. My friend done me a CV. I'd never had a CV before. Sent it to the security office in London. It was my office in London. I was actually behind theirs. I never thought I'd have an office behind theirs. Wow. Um, and they rung. Uh, I can't remember how it's worked. I always say they rung me. They can't have done um, because back then, I don't remember having a mobile phone. They were around, but I don't remember having one. Yeah. We used to get um, cards, phone cards. Yeah, so yeah. I, I called out on the phone cards, and they said, uh, we, re- we really want to give you an interview, but you're still in the military, aren't you? I said, I am. Yeah, you know, I'm still out in Iraq, actually. So we can't touch you while you're in the military. Um, you, have to, you, know, you have to be clear of it. So um, I decided what I wanted to do. I went to see one of the sergeant majors, told them what I wanted to do, and I was still quite young. They said, look, it's entirely up to you. You're a young soldier. I was only a soldier. I wasn't of any rank. Um, c- kind of do a leave of absence for two to three years. Uh, go and do your private security thing. Buy a house. And if you want to come back to the army, you'll still be able to come back and you won't mm. be too old to carry on as a soldier. So it kind of swung it for me. I thought, that's, a, you know, that's not a bad idea because hopefully I should still get the best of both worlds and yeah. I'll be back in the army again by the time I'm 25, 26. Um, so I left, I got offered a job, um, within a month I was back out in Iraq as a private security contractor. Okay. Uh, I think I just turned 24 or something like that. Oh wow, okay. Uh, so I was quite young. So you came back from the war? Yeah. And I you had to go back. back out there again, <laughs> yeah. And I did nearly three years between, yeah. um, predominantly up in Baghdad, I did a bit of time in Basra. And so this was like kind of being a bodyguard for diplomats and whatnot? Yeah, so I started off on an American contract for a yeah. company called KBR, which is an oil co- company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I then, in, when I was up in the north of the country, I worked for the Japanese. The Japanese had a contract, the uh, Japanese government had a contract bringing in big, huge generator substations to power uh, areas of Baghdad, give, give them electricity back. Got it. Um, so from, from Jordan into Baghdad, I used to go out on convoys and bring these big substations in. Wow. But they only used to be able to run, I think it was something like 12k an hour or something, or mm. 15k an hour, it was, you know, super slow. Really? Um, so we used to get hit all the time on that job, because we could only stay on the main supply routes. Mm. Um, so yeah, we used to get hit and hit hard quite often on that. On the on the vehicles, we had transponders that if you got attacked, you pressed, pressed the buttons, and it would go to, for, to an operations room, and it would ask if you're okay and do you need help. Oh, but yeah. also... Because it's so strict on our speed limit, which normally it wasn't on other convoys, mm. the Japanese had access to that and they could see how fast we was running. So if we ever went over to sort of 2025, 20, we'd get a phone call saying you need to slow down. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, we used to get hit. We had a couple of extra gun trucks on that. So we had six gun trucks and then we had five or six substations that would come in. Wow. But I mean, convoys out there at the time, um, a lot of guys lost their lives on that job. Really? Yeah, a lot of Why? Um, wasn't just many ambush. Re- yeah, basically. just constant. Yeah, ambushes, uh, improvised explosive devices, roadside bombs. Wow. Vehicle, um, vehicle born IEDs. You know where um, they just drive a vehicle into you and detonate. And so that that is just um, how would you put it? You said it before. Insurgents. That that yeah, those the insurgency. Of, yeah, who don't yeah. want Westerners in the country. Basically, don't want Westerners here. Yeah. And so they they'd attack. Yeah, they'd attack. And it wasn't to like steal anything or anything. No, like that. they weren't no. interested. If they could take us hostage, they would like that. Ah, okay. Um, got it. But quite did often, they ever? No, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, some people did. Yeah. So some some of the guys did. Not from my company, but from other companies. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of one of the first videos we got shown. Uh, when I was in the office in London before I got the job, mm. was a, a company called Blackwater, who's changed company name a few times. It's an American company. Um, had two um, private security operators in a car in the north of Iraq, and they got ambushed, dragged out of the car, um, shot five or six or maybe more times. I'm going back a bit here, so I can't remember exactly. I hadn't sent on the details, but yeah. dragged through the streets, hung. Oh my God. Hung from the uh, flyovers and set on fire. Oh my god! Uh, all videoed. 
Oh. And it was kind of, that was the video we had to watch to kind of see if you're sure you wanted to go and work in, you know, I'd just come back from there, so it didn't really make a difference to me. But yeah, um, they, they kind of showed you that because they didn't want to keep start sending people out who didn't really want to be there. And um, that didn't phase you? Oh, I'd just come back from there. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I hadn't come back from there, yeah. um, I don't know. I might did you lose a lot of friends out there? Uh, I, 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 in private security, I did, yeah. Really? Yeah, More yeah. than the army? I didn't really lose any in the army. What? Um, okay, I didn't expect that. I mean, my, my stint in the army out there was just over, just short of, uh, it was about six months. Mm. My stint in private security in Iraq was three years. Okay. So my exposure to it was a lot more. Also, I was up north. Things with private security is a lot more dangerous as well. You know, if you, if you go down the road with the army, yes, a lot of guys still get killed, but you've also got tank support, air support. Exactly. We had none of that. When we was out doing the convoys, particularly, yeah. you'd be because you're, you're pretty much hired by like a private company. Yeah, as your private to, security. The military would help. Yeah, um, certainly air cover for if you got hit and you needed medical cover. The yeah. helicopters were coming, but you wasn't first on the list. Got you know, if if air guys were somewhere else doing an operation and they were needed, you'd have to wait. Wow. Um, so you you kind of had what you had. I mean, the, on the gun trucks, um, we had two medical kits on each truck. Uh, each individual had to carry their medical kit on their legs. Um, and if you if you got hit, I'd use your medical kit on you. Wow. You never used it on yourself. And on top of that, we had four body bags. Um, if you run out of body bags, we use sleeping bags. Oh so, dear. I mean, that oh, kind of tells exactly. you, for private security job. It's crazy, uh, huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, did you ever get injured while, while you were on the job? Um, not really. We got blown up. I got blown up... Um, Everyone got hit by IEDs on that job, to be honest. Some better than others. Some so IED stands for? Uh, uh, improvised, ex- improvised Explosive Device. Okay. And so uh, Not always, but commonly they were artillery shells, 155 shells strapped together. Mm. But it depended how they were sighted. You know, if they, if they, if they sighted them well, um, it could give you a good wallop. If they weren't and they may be stuck in the ground too far, the ground would take a lot of the, the explosion and you might be lucky. But also in the earlier days, they used to detonate using mobile phones. Really? So they had to judge on the phone when to call for when you was driving past. So they'd always be in the distance, always in eye shot somewhere. Um, Sounds but, like something out of a movie. Yeah, it? well, that's kind of where the movies get it from today if you see things like that. Um, but as time went on, they got more educated and they used pressure plates under the road and laser beams and all sorts of different bits. You know, that they moved with it when every time we got wires to anything they was doing. But you they, got hit they, a couple of times while you were out on the job. IEDs, yeah. Yeah, I had nothing, nothing serious at all. I mean, oh, wow. one, I remember one of the jobs I was on, um, it was four, four gun trucks going out to Jordan. I think we got hit three or four times in 30 minutes. Oh, my God. And we was, we was going to pick up. We hadn't even picked up the kit yet. Um, what but, goes through your mind when you get hit? It's loud. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's loud. I remember one... So you're sitting in a Range Rover? Uh, no, oh. so we, for that, we, we had Ford 350 trucks. Ford 350 trucks. Yeah, And the, the these ones. were armoured then? They know. were armoured. Yeah, okay. I was, it had to be armoured. The contract I was doing, we'd actually taken from another company. It was using soft skin Suzuki Pajeros, um, and they kept getting wiped out. You know, I think there's one instance... So that, that IED that hit you... If you were in a non-armoured car, would that have been a different uh, story? Probably not, because it was sighted really bad, and to be honest with you, it detonated short of where it should have done. Oh, got so it. So pro- probably not. But then shrapnel, it always ripped for a soft skin, so wow. you could have easily caught a bit of shrapnel up quite wow. easily. But I remember driving past one in a big tractor tyre inside, and I saw it, and uh, I tried telling the guy behind me, but I just didn't get, he didn't get the, the message quick enough. And, and? It, it went off and hit him. But again, it, it wasn't... It wasn't it, too bad. No, it wasn't too bad. Wow. But some of them, some of the guys, you know, um, some were killed, some were quite bad injuries. Mm. But there's a thing called shape charges. Um, they're always the worst ones because they used to even rip through the armour. Wow. Um, it was a shape charge in Baghdad one year with the US military and it ripped through one of their main battle tanks. Wow. So they were getting better... At, mm. at these things um, and normally that was a kill you know if, if one of it, I never got hit by one of them um, but yeah I mean that, that was I learned a lot on that job certainly medically um, I did that for medically long, in what sense like or just treating people and you know so you, medical, you've had to do that the medical package of it yeah and you do a lot of training for it as well so you're not but in, you've been in, in a scenario and, where somebody's been hit and then you've had to... Yeah, not, 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 I haven't done anything too horrendous, luckily. Most, I mean, yeah. most of it was trauma, everything we did anyway. So 
bandages, tourniquets. It, we used to have an hour to keep people alive for. Wow. Um, so IV, you know, intravenous drips because of blood loss. Um, morphine, everyone had their own morphine. Um, it's crazy. It, it, was, it was a lot to think about, but it was, in terms of med- medical world, it's kind of a, a group of things we had to really do, and that was it. Mm. It never really went out too much outside of that. So you've done that for three years? Yeah, I've had, I left. I decided I'd enough of that, Yeah. Um, as you can imagine. Was there a tipping point? I, I always said the morning, because I've always done this through my whole career with everything. If I wake up and don't want to do it anymore, um, I don't cut my nose off to spite my face and don't do it, but I start making plans for what I'm going to do next. I won't sit in something. If I generally really, we all have good days and bad days at work and everything else, but if I generally think I really don't want to do this anymore, um, I start making a move. And, and I did that out there. I went back after leave, actually. I just had four weeks leave. And I, I got back out and I thought, I don't, I, I've had enough of this. Um, and I put my notice in for a month. Problem with it is as well, as I've always said out there, where if it all goes wrong, everyone needs to be worth their weight in gold. And if you're someone who's not particularly want to be out there or you know worried about being out there or want to mm. be at home, it's not fair on everyone else. Got because it. when it starts to go wrong, you've got to give 110%. Yeah. Not just for yourself, but for everyone else. And yeah, if you're yeah. someone who doesn't really want to be there... You know, it's best. You might not do that. Yeah, yeah, well, you won't do it. It's just best to get out of it. Get so, out. Yeah. And I started not wanting to be there, so I left. Told the the office that, um, I wanted to come back. I think I had. I said, "Where do you want to go next? What was it you want to do next?" And Afghanistan, for the company at the time, had been going for about a couple of years, I think. Mm. Um, and I said, well, I wouldn't want to have a look at Afghanistan by this stage now. <laughs> One second, so you decided that you had enough in Iraq. But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind Afghanistan. Yeah, Afghanistan was but, ramping up back in 2000. So what was it that you were actually missing in Iraq? Uh, what was I missing in Iraq? So what, what, were, what were you either missing or slash lacking in I Iraq? just wanted to do a different country. Oh, got it. Yeah, I just right. wanted to do a different country. Because ultimately the job's not going to be massively different. Although I had quite a good job in Afghanistan, I'd say shortly. But um, the job's, you know, still firearms, it's still dangerous. It's still kind of the same sort of weather to a oh, certain extent. Yeah. Um, but I, I said I'd like to go to Afghanistan and they said, okay, no problem, we'll be in touch. And I think it was only two days later or something. I just, uh, I was in another car garage actually at the time. Um, a friend of mine used to be a car salesman many years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, I just sat down in front of him because I haven't seen him for a long time and they called me and said, mm. we've got a slot, can you go to Afghanistan? So I said, yeah, no problem, when are you thinking? He said, well, can you go tonight? Oh my God. So, um, and in my experience, of, again, with all my businesses and everything else I've done, if it's if you can do that, you'll normally progress a lot quicker. Mm. Because I, I thought, if I say no to this, um, when when's the next slot coming up? And I'm not going to maybe not even get the same job. So I said yes. I went, um, and I went on a foreign Commonwealth Office contract, looking after HMRC officers. Um, yeah, everyone always says HMRC. What are they, what are they what doing? They doing in the, HMRC is not just tax, obviously. Um, that's what that's what they're known for because it affects everybody. But um, they also do the borders, so they, they're at your airports, at your ports, mm. um, and they had HMRC officers in Afghanistan. We was mentoring mm. the the narcotics police out there, so we were taken to all the airports in the country to make sure that uh, the drug search dogs and everything else was being done correctly. Why why would HMRC have a vested interest in Afghanistan? Um, they didn't as such, but because it was British government. With helping rebuild the country, oh, okay, they were part of that. It's we, we, there like was prison advice. officers out there as well, helping mentor the new upcoming prisons, and uh, so there's all sorts of elements from the UK. It's almost like advisory service. Yeah, yeah, that's all it was really. Yeah. And we was going out checking. They were being trained, and then we was going out and checking on them to make sure that um, they were doing what they were been trained to do. Basically, all right. the city, all the cities had city gate checkpoints um, for drugs and cars, so we'd go out, we'd fly out to them. Um, and just do a spot check on all these places. So I, d- I did that for a couple of years, mm. um, and that was really good fun. We used to have three vehicles on that, all armoured, drive on the back of a C-130 aircraft, fly mm. out to wherever it was we was going, do the visit, fly back. Wow. Um, so it's, you know, in terms of a job for a, a close protection officer, if you like, it's quite good fun. Because it's an FCO contract, we had all the right weapons, all the, all the good kit and equipment, and we was well looked after. Um, so I enjoyed that. One of the leaves I had, I could just come home from there, I had four weeks off, just got up to Edinburgh to see a friend, and I had a call off someone, mm. um, and they said, could you look after a businessman in London? Mm. And uh, I thought, I've, I've only got four weeks off, and I'm in Edinburgh. Mm. And I just thought, I don't really want to do this. I said, I, I can't, I've got four weeks off, I'm in Edinburgh, but, you know, so I won't be able to do it. 
So I said, you sure you can't do it? I said, yeah, I'm sure I can't do it. And I put the phone down. At that stage, I'd never worked in the UK as a bodyguard. It had all been Middle East. Yeah. Um, they called me back and they, said, they put the money up and said, you know, can you come and do it? So I said to my mate, I said, look, they've asked me to go. He said, go, you've got to go. He said, go and do it. It was 10 days, I think it was. Um, it'd give you a little taste to see what it's like working in London. Um, so I said, okay, I'll do it. Flew back down. The next day, um, I can't remember if it was Luton or Stansted Airport as well, I had to be. Couldn't get home to Eastbourne in time because I missed my flight. I had to get a later flight. So I had to buy all brand new kit, mm-hmm. suit and shoes and the whole thing, all crisp out of the packet. Yeah. Um, and it was Michael Jackson. Oh, wow. So I spent 10, I think it was 10 days, 10, 12 days, something like that with Michael Jackson. A close protection. Close protection, yeah. Wow. It was five of us on the job. Um, but, so five, you, you joined five other bodyguards? For yeah, him, yeah right? altogether it was five. Five English, and actually it's six, five English, one American. He okay. Bought, but he bought one with him. Wow. Um, so what was that like? It's a bit of an eye-opener. Really? Yeah, I mean, obviously I didn't How, know. What, uh, what year was this, by the way? 2006, 2006. No, November 2006. Okay, fine. Yeah. When did he die again? I'm going to say 2010. Okay, fine. fine. Well, I'm not so 100% sure. Later, later there, stage there. of his career, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think he was ramping up to do this um, concert in yeah, the O2 and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he might, I mean, like, to be fair, I was a fan. She still am a fan, but there must have been. I, I, if you ever watch any of his old concerts and stuff, where people just start passing out, yeah, just see yeah, him. Yeah. Like, did you see a lot of that? His happen? fan base was huge. I mean, we stayed in the Hempel Hotel in Bayswater, and I'm not even sure if that's there now either. But doesn't ring a bell. No, no. I think it's gone. And uh, it's a nice sort of like a smaller boutique hotel, and uh, it started off with. Uh, the, the hotel had extra security for it. Mm. Um, event, we had to put barriers out the front. Event, yeah. We had a police presence. Uh, you know, the, the, the crowds outside were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. A lot of the fans had black taxis on the meter all day what? just so they could jump into it whenever they want, you know, wanted to follow us. Wow. So any time we went anywhere, we had, I think it was uh, <coughs> maybe a four or five car move now. Um, and, you know, f- f- four, five, six black cabs behind Paps on the motorbikes as well. Bloody so moving that them must around, have been terrible. No? Yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare yeah. for the security side of things. Yeah, it's all. Whenever you got him back into somewhere inside, yeah. it's always sort of a breath of fresh air. You know. What was he like as a person? He was all right. He was quiet. We didn't have much interaction with him. Yeah. Um, because there's so many people around him all the time. You know, with his, um, you know, his PAs and his, his uh, record manager. Or whatever, you know, it's, it's about I'm guessing you wouldn't travel in the same car as him. You, you'd. Be oh, I, d- I didn't. I you didn't because I, I so as five was so the main bodyguard yeah. the American guy travelled with him yeah. all the time yeah. and then we had I can't remember I think it's only one of us in each car so we must have another four or five cars wow. which were empty really just okay. just just an entourage to, just in case we entourage. needed it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was always empty I was but was um, there any uh, crazy scenarios with them like you know him trying to just go for a a, a quiet meal no no, no cause it, because because. You can't do it. I mean, we did go. We did go for quiet meals, if you like. But it, the restaurant was in a, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a closed part of the restaurant for him. But it was all well rehearsed that we was turning up to the management, you know, so everyone else was kept away. And then the only problem you'd have was getting him from the car to the restaurant. That, yeah. um, but you kept that gap as small as possible. Or go through some back entrance. Yeah, or, or try something. a back entrance if you can. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? We. we as the general public, we we have this perception that these guys have the best lives ever. But actually, yes and no. Is 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 a lot of pros to it. Yeah. There's also a lot of cons. Yeah, he could. You can. I mean, now he can't. But <laughs> he yeah. could back then. He could never just walk down the street. No, you could. So I'm gonna pop around the park for ten minutes and have yeah. a sandwich and just go walk. I go on my own. It's fine. Breath fresh air. No one's gonna recognise me. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. But you work could have like a mask that. on and people would still recognise him. Yeah, right? yeah. It's just. It's not. It's not. Wasn't safe. I mean, I don't know. For all the celebrities, there's certain places in the con- in the world, so they can go where they probably get left alone more than yeah. others. Um, Where's here? No, not in this country, yeah, but in the world. Not. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like if you wanted to go shopping and stuff, what would he do? Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, some of them can dress up a bit, and some of them do. Yeah, I would like put decoys on. Yeah, kind of not over top. We don't. You don't have sort of uh, Beyonce walking around in a beard or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> but would be interesting. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, they might put bigger jackets on, caps on, and, yeah, yeah. and then they just go out um, with their security until you get noticed. And if you get noticed and it starts becoming too much, you have to call it a day. You have to call it a day. Yeah. Wow. And then. Um, so then Michael Jackson was your first one, then how many other ones? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. So I went back to Afghanistan for about another year or so, and then when yeah. I come back, I decided I had enough out there. Yeah. Moved back to London. 
um, did a work with the Dubai Royal family. Wow. For, I think it was two years, two summers. A, a solely dedicated to them? Yeah, I think it's about eight months each year the job was. What was that like? Uh, I didn't do anything really, to be honest. Really? It's quite an easy number for me. Yeah. yeah. So the family, um, again, I don't know if it's changed now, I'm a bit out of touch with it, but had a lot of security for different mm. parts of the family and everything else. But you only needed... And the family's all, big, right? Yeah, it's huge, yeah. And I was only needed when uh, when they come in. And one of the years, you know, the guy I had only come in for a few days. So, But they, they hire you you're for the whole still paid, you're still, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, you still... Did they have any more jobs going? Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> do you know what? It's a nice pace of life after yeah. being in Afghanistan. Yeah, I can imagine. But I think it's my second year. I used to think, oh, you know, I'm getting paid for not doing a lot, but... You're on standby all the time. Yeah. Can't we do anything? It started getting a bit, bit tedious. Yeah, 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 did a little bit. Um, and it wasn't long after that, I started my own security company. Oh, really? So 2010, roughly, we're at now. Yeah. Um, I'd just gone out, actually. I'd just finished the Dubai job. Yeah. Um, I'd just gone out to Morocco yeah. to do my first movie with Matt Damon. Oh, wow. Um, and I so wasn't... So how did that come about? Well, I wasn't an actor then. Uh, I was a bodyguard still. Mm. Um and I signed up. So going back slightly on the convoys in Iraq, the guy who used to um, look after and deal with weapons for us on our camp yep. was an older guy who'd done a long time in the military. And I said to him, what was you doing before you come out here then? Because he left the army quite a long time before. And he said, oh, I was a military advisor, advisor on the movie Troy. Oh, wow. Um, so I thought, well, that sounds good. Uh, started asking him all about it. And he gave me, he wrote a number down on a card. I put it in my bag. And I kind of forgot about it because I knew while I was working away, I'd never be able to do anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, when I moved to um, for the Dubai job, I moved up to London in Battersea, which was where I still live today. Oh, really? Um, and I emptied all my kit out and the card fell out. And the, the place for this office was in Shepherd's Bush, which is obviously just around the corner around from the there. Corner, yeah. yeah, so um, I, I rung them up and they said, look, we're, we're not taking anyone on. If it's just casting agency, we're not taking anyone on. Um, but if you do all your paperwork, when the book opens again next year. Yeah. So I did all that, tons and tons of paperwork, um, sent it in, and then uh, went to the gym no more than about a week later, come out, and there was uh, the days you could leave your mobile phone in the locker. I can't, mm. can't get away can't with that anymore. That <laughs> yeah. um, there's a voicemail saying, hi, my name's, I think it's Chuck. Mm. Um, will you fly out on Monday to Morocco do a Damon film? I played a US Special Forces soldier. Um, I thought Decent money in it? Yeah, it went back because I was out there for quite a long time. I was out there for... What, what, what does a job like that pay? Um, do you know what? Back then, I can't remember. It was a day rate. But I'll tell you where we made a lot of money as well was you used to get per diem on set to pay for food for the day. But okay. even if you ate on set, which because food was always supplied as well, so you never spent any per diem. What's per diem? Per diem is... Um, it's like cash... Okay. To feed yourself. Okay, fine. So you get that. given you get by the company. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, so cool. it give you just for like food or maybe washing or whatever it is you need to yeah. do, like an allowance. I guess yeah, yeah. that's another way of putting it. Um, but you weren't spending any of it <laughs> because yeah. we we was eating on set all the time. Ah, so um, cool. yeah, we made a, is it. Weren't, but I can't remember what I made now. If I'm honest, because it, it was about it's just short of two months I was there for. Wow. In the end, um, and it come right the at set. the end of the Dubai job. Yeah, in, in Morocco. Yeah. Wow. And what, what was uh, Matt Damon like then? Did you get He was to- all right, yeah. He yeah. went there the whole time. He'd come back for certain shoots. Yeah. Um, Jason Isaacs was in it as well. He was there longer. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that was my kind of my first taste of working on, on a film set. And I remember we did a night shoot, um, and it was a big, this big scene in a village. The production company had paid for the whole village to move out. No way. Um, <laughs> and they housed them somewhere. In Morocco. Yeah, they yeah. housed them somewhere else. So we weren't allowed in the houses because they were people's houses. But all the streets and out, you know, all around their houses we were using for this big battle scene. Oh, wow. Um, and, and I remember doing it, I think we did it three times in that night because it wasn't particularly long. It was like two, two minutes. Yeah. But it took a long time to reset because things were blowing up and brick walls were blowing up and... Um, so for every two minutes of film and we had like a two and a half hour wait or something like that for it to reset again it's not as glamorous as it, uh, everything <coughs> it's not but out. I remember <coughs> excuse me I remember thinking because it's hot out there as well and uh, you know also I'd fire, I'm firing blank ammunition I remember thinking this is exactly what it used to feel like but without the, without the stress and the hassle of being shot yeah yeah and it was quite and uh, people dying yeah yeah <laughs> it, all of that had gone you know and then obviously we put two two and a half minutes of hard work in yeah and then you, you sit on your backside for two and a half hours <laughs> waiting or having a chat I thought I could get used to this yeah, this nice. is alright this is so, so kind of then I, I knew that later on I was gonna 
pursue the acting and the film work a lot more. But I couldn't then because I was still a working bodyguard. So, yeah. you know, I still had a lot to do in that industry for me. So you came back and then you, you've been working with all sorts of clients now. Yeah, after that, I went on the ships for a little while. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so you, you were working, like, protecting ships from pirates and stuff Yeah, the like. old tankers, LPG tankers, car carriers, whatever it was, really. Or used to cut through a place called Babel Mendip, which was from the Gulf of Aden, and it cut through past Egypt down Port Suez. Got it. Um, down the Suez Canal. Suez Canal, um, yeah. Now it could go round, but it added like four days onto their yeah, journey. Yeah, that's the problem that they're facing now, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, know. yeah. So they, they uh, but what it used to do is to channel all the vessels into a, I don't know, four, four mile radius or something. Yeah. Every 15 minutes, one used to p- uh, pass through off the coast of Somalia, they'd come out and attack. That's crazy. Um, so they, to start with, they were getting attacked a lot, and then they started having security teams on them, unarmed, and then it went to security teams armed. Yeah, over the years. were you armed? I did a few unarmed to start with, um, and then we went armed. And so did you have any cl- uh, close calls there then? Um, I, I didn't have s- s- close calls as such. I had some horrible trips, what, sort of trips that were going to be 10 days, and I was gone six weeks, one of them. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I'm not greatest at sea anyway. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nah. I it's only probably the worst job you could have yeah, well, gone for then. There's a, there's a number of courses you have to do. For, I, I wanted to, anything I want to do, I was going to do it. And yeah. I wanted to be involved. I wanted to try it and see what it was like. And I did it on and off. We used to go 10 days at a time was, and you'd come back. Mm. And it was good because my security company was new, wasn't earning enough money d- just to do that mm. from it. So yeah. I was doing 10 days at sea, coming back, spending the rest of the time on the business and kind of went on for nearly two years doing that. Wow. Um, it's crazy and it was good fun you know I got yeah. to a lot of different countries and meet a lot of different people yeah that was good but it also allowed me to build my business in London mm. um, during that time so then when you came back that's when you started um, acting for like Kendall Jenner and yeah so I I, I was a freelance a bodyguard when I come back to yeah. to London um, Kendall Jenner I think was probably one of my first one London Fashion Week okay. for two I think it was two in a row um, that girl's done seriously well She's yeah, like a billionaire now. Yeah, yeah, no, she has. She's done very well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all have that lot. Yeah, we've all done well. Yeah, she, she's the most successful. Believe it or not. Yeah, oh, right. No. Is she? It's oh, Kylie. No. Which one? Is it Kylie? Bloody hell! I don't even know anymore. No, sorry, sorry it, I beg your pardon. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Who's the one who's got the makeup? <laughs> Whoever's got the makeup, I think it's her. Uh, who is? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's Kylie. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, you're right. I was getting makeup. confused. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't. I've obviously not watched the. Program. All the people, apart from Michael yeah. Jackson, all the people I've looked after, I've had to Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the first instance obviously I know it all very well now but back back then I didn't have a clue who anyone was really um, and then so you, you you had a story with uh, Bella Deed right where she which uh, was a little bit problematic so how, how did like tell us about the story and what goes through your mind when a client's saying no I want to go and do something um, so I, I worked with Bella for a couple of years uh, maybe might, might have been free I can't remember it wasn't all the time it was only when she came to London so it, it was sporadic on and off sometimes the visits were longer than others etc um, I used to get really well Bella you know we, we had, she was quite an easy girl to work with she worked hard she was a nice girl you know very respectful um, and p- predominantly when I look, used to look after people I used to give them a free reign anyway I never said we can't do this we can't do that you know if 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 I generally thought we shouldn't do something because I always gave people a free reign, if I said we can't do that, normally they said, okay, that's fair enough. Um, and it's the only time, really, with, with Bella, we'd just been to an event, a Takua event. I think they just made her a watch at the time. Yeah. Um, and we just left there. We was in a Rolls Royce. She was in a ball gown. I was in a suit, which was supplied by, I can't remember whoever they were, you know, different brands. Um, and we got to Grosvenor Square in London, and there was a free Palestine march. Um, I can't remember what year. This is a long time before anything was happening now. Okay, yeah. This is like 2012, I'm going to say. All oh, right. 2012? That's a lie. 2016, something like that. Um, and she said, oh, I want to get involved. And I was on my own. Mm. Um, and I said, oh, it was, it's not, you know, this is not a good idea. <laughs> um, I'm on my own. I said, not to mention, we're not, we're not dressed for the occasion. You know, because you've got to think as well is people do get anti- affluent people yeah, yeah, at yeah. times you know we've got uh, you know we're chipped up in a Rolls Royce and everything else it's not it's not always a good good yeah, way to do things probably wasn't a good idea yeah, yeah. Um, and I was on my own you know it's, it's, it's crowds and crowds and crowds of people and I've worked in protests before looking IT, after ITV and BBC news reports oh got it yeah. so I know exactly how quickly 
protests can get out of hand and you yeah. can lose people and all sorts of things. Wow. So I said, no, thank you, let's not, you know. And she said, no, 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 I want to do it, I want to do it. I said, it's not a good idea, we can't do it, you know, I'm on my own, it's just not appropriate. No, 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 I want to do it. And I thought, right, she really wants to do it. So very quickly, I was close to possibly, you know, if she got out on her own, what do I do? I can't sit in the car. Mm. So I thought, let's tell her I'd do it and come up with a plan as quick as possible because that's going to be safer than her just getting out of me having to follow her. Um, and I said, all right, okay, we'll do it. I said, but we're going to dip in and dip out. And the whole time I'm going to be holding, have a hold of you the whole time. Because if you don't, as soon as someone steps in between, not necessarily on purpose, but then they're two people deep, three people deep, five people deep, and then you, you, you're nowhere near them. So I yeah. said, I want to make sure I've got one hand somewhere on you the whole time. And she said, yeah, that's fine. Anyway, we popped out, um, we got into the crowd, did what you know, a bit of bit of supporting if you like. I'd hold of her waist the whole time. The police were there as well. And luckily a few police officers closed in. And I said, right, I said we're going. And then she again she's happy we've actually done what she wanted to do. Um she agreed and we just moved straight by the car. Police helped us get back to the car hmm. and we shot off. So wow. it worked out fine. Yeah. Would I have wanted to do it? No. You know, it's yeah. not really the sort of thing you should be doing really. But at the same time, you've got to manage the situation. Mm. You know, these people she, she obviously is something that was dear to her, something that was close to her heart. Um, and I think, you know, obviously the, she has a connection with her father and everything else with, with that side of the world. Okay. And she wanted to do it. So, you know, it made sense. yeah, I, I couldn't let her get out on her own. So if she'd just got out of the car, hmm. um, I'd have had to have gone. So I just decided to agree to it and then just do it the safest and the quickest way we could. Fine. Yeah. But now you've got 250 um, staff in your security company, right? Yeah. Ascari. Ascari Secure. Secure. Yeah. And um, so London's a pretty dodgy place at the moment, would you say? Yeah, oh, it's, it's worse it's ever been. Right. For, since, I've been since 2008, I've been in London. What do you put it down to? Uh, I don't like to say it really, but it's a lack of lack of police officers. Really? Yeah. So g- government's cut back on cut back, yeah, cut back after cut back. Yeah. I mean, the amount of police stations that you've seen close over the last few years is just nuts. It's yeah, like, why the and hell are you closing a lot them of, down? I've, I've, I've mentioned this in other podcasts before as well. A lot of the police officers now they work on their own. They're single crewed in the vehicles. Now, when they turn up, others others will turn up as well. But quite often, you, especially where you know, Chelsea, Kensington, where I see, see yeah. them driving around, um, they're often single crewed because they haven't got enough enough people. Um, it's like just to hear stories I mean actually not far from you I remember seeing this uh, a video of a guy out with his wife and these five guys surround him one's got a machete they're trying to take his watch off yeah, him yeah, and it's yeah. just like he's trying to fight back and yeah it's just unbelievable it's yeah like, there's tons of out the watch yeah. theft I mean it's a bit of a pandemic really even now yeah um it's still quite bad it's just maybe not reported on quite as much really um, I mean I saw recently that the police were trying to hit back yeah and like undercover and then, yeah, yeah. you know let them but it's nuts because um I mean just for the the average person going into London now there's just no point in wearing something nice like a, you a know, lot of people Rolex don't watch now. or whatever yeah a lot of people don't know or they put it on when they get to wherever they're going yeah, well that's right yeah, yeah people put it in their pockets yeah. and they do it but then uh, part of the problem I'm hearing at the moment is the restaurant that you might go to and you put the watch on down there the waiter's bloody in on it yeah. so he'll, he'll yeah, tell he somebody do, outside yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all the, certainly all the private members' clubs and places like that now, yeah. there's a lot of people loitering out the front. Really? Um, because they almost know that every every wrist or every other wrist that comes out of one of those places is going to have something nice on it. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Um, I, won't, I won't name the, name the clubs because it's probably not particularly good for business, but it's certainly in Mayfair, yeah, there's a few around there. Which You're going to say Annabelle's, aren't you? No, 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 <laughs> no, no close to it. Yeah, I'm not, but I'm, to be fair to them, I don't know, but I'm sure they have the same problem. No, I mean, pretty much every single one yeah. would. I, I yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't um, say it's one in particular, but no, it's just nuts that, that, you know, I've heard stories of people getting dragged out of their cars, and these are people that I know Yeah, getting dragged out of their cars. Yeah, it's, it's the quite, world. I don't like to say it, it's quite common in, in, in our, uh, the higher net worth community. Yeah. It is, it is quite common, and, and some of the gangs, they, they won't stop at anything, you know, they chop your arm off. That's just crazy. If it means they can take the watch. And, ob- and so surely that's led to higher demand for you, for people coming in from abroad and, well, not for you personally, for the company. For yeah, company, we've had yeah. a few, um, particularly a few, uh, 
can't remember after two or three years ago now there was a there's a young man who got stabbed to death around the back of Howard's for his watch I heard about this I yeah think. yeah um, I mean um, wealthy yeah uh, yeah yeah um, I don't know what he had on there something you know a few quid on and uh he, he obviously I only wanted his watch but I think he put up a bit of resistance and ultimately he was stabbed to death oh my god um so yeah I mean when that incidents like that in London happen I mean there's actually a billboard that drives around Knightsbridge now it says be careful with your watch on it yeah, you know, I mean, when, when since when have we had to do that in this well, country? Look, there's one thing, you know, walking out of Knightsbridge, uh, sorry, Harrods, with a nice watch on, and then somebody comes and mugs you. But then there's other videos where somebody, I, I remember seeing one in Knightsbridge, just outside of Harrods, and a guy sitting in his Range Rover, scooter pulls up alongside him, smashes the window. Yeah, yeah. Hitting him, yeah. and then takes off his watch. It's like, yeah, I mean, you it, can't even sit in your own bloody car. No, anymore. exactly. You can't. Well, Grave Square, that was, I think, that one. Was uh, it? Yeah, oh. and and the problem with it is, as well, is it doesn't stop there. You know, they will throw acid. They no will, they will use hammers. Really? I remember years ago, Park Lane. Um, I used to look after a guy who lived in the Dorchester Hotel um, quite a few years ago, um, and so I was there quite a lot. And I remember there used to be guys on motorbikes around that period of time mm. and they had disc cutters that were, they were like battery powered disc cutters uh, they just cut your arm to cut you off at the no. arm yeah yeah I mean they, they didn't want to do it but that was what they had them for to say if you don't give me a watch I'm gonna oh I'll just cut your arm off god um, that's just crazy isn't it yeah we had but another guy it was nothing to do with us um, but he'd been walking down Park Lane relatively late one mm. evening um, Scooter Gang come after him for his watch he managed to run off um, and they run over him, snapped, snapped his leg joking. at the top. Yeah. Um, he managed to drag himself around onto the Dorchester lobby, yeah. um, where he kind of got taken into the lobby itself for, for refuge, yeah. and, they, and they left. But, you know, I mean, he'd probably never walk again, probably. Oh, my God. So he saved his watch, but, I mean... Mate, you've come back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and suddenly yeah, down, well, you come down to a country where, you know... Stuff's happening. Well, even the, even uh, the smashing grabs in the shops and well, I've, I know I've seen it. It's all, it's all gone. Yeah. yeah, it's all gone. It's all gone up, and, it, yeah. and it's continuing to go up. And the police are they're doing the best they can with the numbers they've got. That's the problem. Yeah. If you don't get hurt now, it's unlikely they'd turn up straight away. You know, burglaries and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, just just give you a crime number now. And some of it, if it's anything happens on you, if someone smashes your window and takes your phone out your car on the street. I think you even have to report that online now. You just do it you online? Yeah, you yeah. don't even call anyone anymore. I it's mean, just crazy. You know. It really is. But I, I think more than that, it's kind of, you know, you go to, actually I've got a lot of friends, wealthy friends that have decided to move out to D Dubai recently, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, They got their residency down there and then they moved out there. And so then the question is, uh, you know, Why? London's one of the best places in the world. Why are you going to yeah. just get up and go and live down there? He's, and pretty much all of them are the same same things, which is, listen, I want to raise my kids in a country where I don't have to worry. Yeah. Um, that you know, some on the on the walk from school, yeah, yeah. you could get mugged, beaten up, this that, and the other, and then the police won't do anything about it. You know, down there, I'm guessing if you get caught stealing, you know, in Dubai, yeah, yeah, it's a much bigger deal. It's a much bigger deal. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. you know, you, you'd be lucky to have your hands at the end of it, surely. Yeah, right. Or something like that. Yeah, or, it's a much bigger deal. You know, actually, even the drugs pandemic. You know, we don't really get to hear about it much, but there is a massive drugs pandemic. Uh, pandemic there's there's a situation. lot to go with it in this country as yeah. well, though, because not only police officers, all the prisons are massively overcrowded. We've is that a, right? We've got a number of prisons that aren't even fit to be prisons anymore. Really, in terms of um, you know hygiene and uh, really. Or how old the buildings are and stuff like that. You know, they should have been got rid of a long time ago, but we keep we keep them because we've got too many people. Um, so there's a, it's a whole load of stuff. So is is because that's the case in your mind? Is that why perhaps judges might not be giving sentences out would, I, I, as freely as they would have before? I would say on the lesser sentences, yeah. They, they, you know, depending on what it is, I'd say they are a little bit more, but they have to bear that in mind. Yeah. Whereas if you have plenty of room, yeah, you might say, well, give him three months because 
Yeah, you need to learn a lesson. Yeah, you need to learn a lesson. But knowing that knowing how the prison system is at the moment, I would imagine people like that would probably get, you know, two hundred and forty hours community service instead no of something. No way. Are you joking? I, I would think so. Just because I can't see how you if you if you what, robbing somebody and you know that Yeah, is. but again it, it, it depends on if is it a, was it a violent robbery, how did you do it, you know. Oh my god. They're, they're, they're very selective now on Well obviously we've seen it in the car game. Uh, in the over yeah. the last two years, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, like fifty Range Rovers getting. Well, you can't even. I don't think you can even show one in London at the moment. No, no. I mean you can. Yeah, but for got to make that. Uh, went away, and he lived in Marlborough back then, and he went away for a few days. Came back, his Range Rover's gone right. Uh, decides that okay, I'm going to get another Range Rover to replace it. Calls up his insurance company. It's gone. His insurance gone from fifteen hundred quid a year. To 15,000 a year, wow. so 10x, right. right? He's just like, bloody hell, you know, I might as well just go for a BMW yeah, instead. And else. BMW is 1,500 quid, so it's just yeah. like, yeah, but I think Land Rover are, are doing what they're, they're doing. I saw, uh, yeah, I saw a BMW get stolen not that long ago, and it's fully electric. Oh, really? So it should have all the latest technology oh on it. Oh, my God. And the guys drove up in an old Audi. They jumped out. Mm. One went over to the uh, driver's door, and the other one had some sort of device that he put on top of the tyre and the front tyre. Yeah. And he had something on his phone. Or yeah. Or some sort of device in his hand. And he heard the guy pull the door or do something to the door. And it didn't open and the guy fiddled around. And then he did it again and it opened and he got in. I thought, wow, that was quick. Yeah, that was really quick. And I thought, all right, he's got in. Let's see if he starts it. Yeah. Um, as quick as he got in, he started it. He, oh had, he had nothing God. else to do when he got in. He just pressed it, drove off. I think about 15 seconds from pulling up to You're going joking. overhead, took it. That was brand new BMW straight out of the factory. Oh my god! I've I've not really heard much about BMWs being stolen. Like yeah, that. that's crazy. Yeah, and it's a fully it's a fully electric. So I know all these ga car garages now are trying to move with it. I think uh, Land Rover particularly. Yeah, I yeah. Think yeah. They've done something now. Where they're saying that you know it, things should be getting better, but it still could take a little while for it to fill through. And not it's just still a sign of um, where we've come to as a. Oh, I know. I don't see any going back really right? now. You reckon? Fortunately, not really. It might it might quieten down slightly, but I, I just I can't see how we're going to pull it back, particularly in London, anyway. For um, many years, right? And uh, like until they really clamp down, they've got they got, and it's going to take a lot of money now because they've ripped it back because you know yeah, saving yeah, yeah. money. They're going to have to put so much more money into it now to get to it re, back to yeah to restart to it to be able to yeah. do it. Yeah, and I think that's going to be. I mean, and not only that, it's time. It's going to take a long time. Even if we had all the, if we had an unlimited box of money to do it. It's still going to take you a good few years for it to slowly all filter through and be sorted out properly. Uh, just another scenario. My mate just told me the other day that he's got, I mean, he's got these two huge um, dogs. What's a kennel corsa? Is that is that a dog? Do you, what's the name of that dog? Something corsa. But anyway, fine. Um, <laughs> uh, he's he's got one of those, and then just another huge dog, and his house has the best security. Right, and um, he's he's normally quite a paranoid guy anyway. Yeah, in, in the best of times, but he um, he went out with his family for a meal. Thought the house is absolutely armed; it's safe with the dogs as well. Thought everything would be fine. One of his dogs just had an operation, so he he had to be put into a room. Oh right. So one is out on the loose. These guys managed to break in. And with a rake. So I'm thinking this huge dog would just absolutely devour these guys, right? But with a rake, managed to, you know, like, stab the dog a couple of times, keep him away from him, and then managed to run upstairs and keep, fend the dog off, went upstairs, tried to break the door down. They, they knew that they were running out of time. Basically, they couldn't get into the door, which had all the goods. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, like all the watches, this, that, and the other. And ended up having to run out before the police came. But that's in a house that has two of the meanest looking dogs I've ever yeah, seen yeah, in my yeah. life, right? A lot of them use meat. They use yeah, meat yeah. And, and lace it with something so the dog gets that's knocked scary. out or whatever, yeah. That's scary. I remember yeah. having, my, I, we used to have a German Shepherd and that was one of the scariest things ever to think that somebody would just throw a piece of meat, you know, laced with something. Yeah, yeah. A, lot, a, lot, a lot of that stuff. And, and it was a big sort of uh, thing of that in Spain where they, they were pumping uh, in sort of British people's uh, villas mm. and that out in Spain, they were pumping some sort of chemical for the air conditioning system. No way. Which was, it wasn't killing people, it was knocking them all out. 
So I, and they were just going in and taking all the stuff. Oh my god! <laughs> I think that crazy. That's it's definitely gone. definitely in Marbella, right? Yeah, it was. <laughs> that's exactly where it was. Yeah. That, that's where all the dodgy bits go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, it was. Yeah, not all the dodgy ones. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation, right? So imagine you get a call one day, and you know Drake is one of the biggest artists in the world at the moment, and he says, "Listen, I'm coming down to London. I'm only here for like a week, and I'm coming down with ten of my entourage." And I need uh, private security. How much would something like that cost? Um, it varies, to be honest with you. There's no set price. Um, it, it just depends on how many guys you you think you might need, where they where they're going. It can also depend on where they're staying, because if you need overnight cover, yeah, um, vehicles. If you're supplying vehicles, not supplying vehicles. Um, it's so many different parameters to it. What I will say is, it's not cheap. <laughs> it, it's so in, let's get let's get a range then. I, I, I was going to say yeah. um, for someone like him coming in for how long do you say? A week. A week. It, it's probably going to be best part of twenty thousand. I would think something wow. around there. Wow. And what what's the most expensive job that you've ever worked on? I don't know because I've only ever really looked after A list, mm. so they probably all come in around the same sort of prices. To okay. be honest with you, because the only reason why it'd be more money is because you spent longer with them. Obviously, every day you cost more money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in t- in terms of sort of initial prices for each person, if I'd looked after say an A lister and a C lister, it'd be a price difference. But because I've only really ever done A listers, mm. they're probably all in the same sort of like the Drake bracket grand. we just said. Yeah, yeah, depending on what. Obviously, if you come in for two days, then it's going to be a lot less than that. But so another thing is that a lot of our customers that own these cars, they all go into Mayfair, you know, they all go to those members clubs and yeah. stuff like that that we were talking about before. But they don't typically have the money to be blowing on private security, nor would they really want to, right? Especially yeah. when you live in the country and you just want to go go with your missus for yeah, a, yeah, a, a yeah. nice meal. Given how dangerous it's got recently, what, what advice would you give to them? Um... It's, it's a fine line with it because I always believe that you should, shouldn't let these things affect your life too much because mm. it's it's not a very fair world now where you've got to change your life dramatically because of other people. Mm. But the fact of the matter is these threats are there and you can't just pretend it's not going to be you. Yeah. So you do have to change things a little bit, but yeah. I, I would always say don't go overboard. For, so for certainly, um, you know, get an Uber into town. Mm. Uh, if you've got a driver, use your driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't bring your Ferrari in, park it outside one of the clubs. You know, um, watches like we mentioned earlier. If you're going in your private vehicle with a driver, you're probably perfectly fine to leave it on. Yeah. Um, but then if you're going in an Uber or, or another way, maybe put it in your pocket. Mm. Uh, and it's women as well, certainly with necklaces and uh, bracelets and rings. Um, you know, your day to day stuff. Mm. Any job in the kids at school, do you need your £560,000 <laughs> engagement ring on? <laughs> <laughs> which before it, you Good wore it every day it didn't matter but yeah. now you know just so it's, it's little 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 things you can do to make yourself um or make you and your family slightly um safer and it's not that much of an infringement Got it. on what you've what you're used to doing yeah. um you could say don't wear it at all i don't believe that's the answer personally yeah. because if you can't have a nice watch or you can't have you know people work hard they want nice things mm. And if you're lucky enough to be in a position to buy these things, you should be able to wear them. Wear them well, that's well. my personal opinion. I think you should be able to wear them, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned you've got a clothing brand. Uh, what's it called and where, where do you sell it? Yeah, Simon Newton London. We launched it last year, uh, last October, which is Bomber Jackets. Um, oh, nice. And yeah. uh, simonnewtonlondon.com is where you find it. We are on Instagram and TikTok as well. But it, it, we've gone for a middle market brand. Yeah. Um, competitions kind of area for, for brands that people would know like Hugo, Hugo Boss yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe Ralph Lauren that's like, it's more streetwear at the moment it's Bomber, Bomber Jackets is where we've gone okay um, nice. we've launched just about to launch I've had a lot of requests actually for Polo Search t-shirts okay, nice. it's all super super quality and obviously yeah. I'm going to say that because it's mine but yeah. um, when you see the, the, the build and the, the materials used it's amazing we just spent a long time finding the right material just for a normal round neck t-shirt because you know we wanted something that's um sort of top quality when you get it out and you, you're almost half excited to put it on if you like. Well, what gave you the idea to create um, your own brand? It, it kind of goes back to the security days again. When I used to look after Bella Hadid, I used to wear someone else's bomber jackets, you know, and other companies. I was put in vogue at the time for being no the um, London, the, the real style style of London Fashion Week. <laughs> no way. Um, 
and I always just thought, when bomber jackets suit me, you know, I've got crew cut, and it's always kind of suited me. I've worn them for very many years. I thought I'm going to make my own one day, yeah. Um, and and I did, um, and that's where we got got to today, uh, and it's kind of now blossomed them into a, a full on clothing brand because of the, the uptake we've had in it, um, you know, the interest we've had of people wanting to buy it and, and and wear it. It's been really good, and it is it is middle market, so it's not cheap, um, but it's not super expensive, but certainly uh, it does it does seem to attract a certain type of customer. Um, and it's just it's done really well so far, to be honest with you. Amazing. So you've got 250 staff working in the uh, security company, Ascari. Ascari Secure. Secure. And um, like, how do you get them all trained? You know, they, uh, some, I guess, are going to be to the highest level in order to accompany these um, A-listers, right? But then the the, the others... I think my mate um, owns a, an app that you might use. It's called Get Licensed. Okay, yeah, I know that. Yeah, that's yeah. quite a, that's quite a big one. That is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So actually, the guys, so all the guys in my office have to be licensed, even though their uh, administration accounts, whatever, whatever they are. If you um, with the SIA license, in they're quite strict. That if you're involved in a security company, there's very few people that can be involved in a security company and not be licensed. So we actually use Get Licensed for oh, really? all the all the guys in the office. Yeah, I make sure that they've got a, they've all got a door supervisor's license. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I've seen it. It's an amazing app. But uh, but the others then they must go through some grueling. Um, yeah, it just depends. From the close protection guys particularly, we yeah. look for... Not, the licence doesn't mean a great deal for that. We look more about previous history, what they've done, where they've been, ex-military, ex-police. Not oh. necessarily, yeah. Um, but just, yeah, to see what see what they've done. But certainly with the door supervision uh, and man guard, you know, security guard and all that sort of stuff. It works well for that. Yeah, it's perfect. And now let's see what's been happening at GV this last week. <laughs> Good afternoon guys, we've got this McLaren 720S and we're doing some crazy stuff to it. So, started to strip it out as you can see behind me. Uh, we're going an exhaust on this, so we've got downpipes and a back box going on. And you already know what that means, we're taking the quarters off, which is not the best job in the world, but we can live with it. So, Ed's got some footage he's going to show you of me taking off some parts. We're getting ready to strip the quarters, spoilers off, back end's getting ready and so on and so forth. So watch this video. In the end, we're gonna put the exhaust on. You're gonna see a little before and after, and you're gonna see the little special touches we do as well. So stay tuned and let's get started. So as you saw, I've taken this trim off. And what this trim does is it covers all the bolts for our rear quarter and for the lower section. So I'm gonna get in here now, take the bolts off for this section of the quarter, and then we're gonna loosen off these. All the trims up top will come off and then there's a couple more bolts inside the arch, and once all of that is out, we can pull this quarter off the car. So, earlier you saw me take this out and I said, it's not as easy as it looks, because it really isn't. So, we look on the back side, we have one bolt on the bottom, and we've got these guide vanes on either side, and there's one little tongue at the front. So that goes into the front of the quarter, and this goes into the sides of the quarter. So how the hell do you get it out? Simple. We imagine that this is back in its place. You gently work it up from the corner here and you tuck that corner down. Once that's gone down, you gently push that side and that goes up. All that's left to do is lift the back up and gently pull it out. Now, it sounds easy, but it's not. So if you're doing this on your McLaren, be very careful. I think I found it. Obviously, McLaren being McLaren, they like to ruin my life every day of the year. In McLaren, watch my video. <laughs> Please put proper bolts in proper places so this can come off like this. As Ed has pointed out, yeah, we've stripped the life out of this car. Look at how many bolts we've taken off. And it's only just one side. That's how many bolts we've taken off and it's only one side. And you still can't see the exhaust. Why? So, if we look in this general area, 
On that side, you can see the quarter panel is there and it closes your access to these parts here. So what we need to do now is take off all of these heat shields, this trim, this back piece here, all of this, and we'll be able to see the back of the exhaust down there. Now, if you look down on this side, we've got to take the intake off, the intake pipe, and just underneath it, you can see that is our down pipes. The down pipes is down here. That's the intake. So you're asking, why are we taking the intake off? Yeah. Because behind here is the lambda sensors and the connections for the exhaust. So we're going to take this off, loosen everything, everything comes off, back box out, down pipes out, and a new exhaust has just arrived actually. My service advisor has just called, said the new exhaust is here. So we'll show you that later on, but it's going to be good. Yes, very organized. Do you know why? Because McLaren doesn't like me and they give me all these bolts. So look, I don't know how many bolts is there there? There's like 200 bolts already. And we're like, not even halfway through the job. That's why you got to organize it. Back box is ready to come off. So if you've watched Art Attack, you know this. Here's one I prepared earlier. Tada! So that's the back box if you come over it and that is what keeps it a bit silent obviously and it opens up with the valves and all of that. Now with McLaren there's one thing you need to know, you need these valve controllers otherwise you get engine management light. So you either need them or you need a remap. So we're going to take them off this and put them on the new exhaust system. We took the back box off, that's gone. Right here we've got the down pipes. So one either side, they've all been loosened off. Luckily, no broken bolts, nothing like that. We've got two brackets at the top. I'm going to take them out. And the downpipes come from underneath. So you would think they'll come out from the top, but there's not enough space. So we will get it out from the bottom through the front of the arch liners, swivel it out. Once the downpipes are out, we're going to go to our other unit and pick up the new exhaust system. I'll show you it there. And we're going to put some heat wrap on it again on the downpipe. Now, if you followed our videos before, you know on 720S when we do downpipes, we put heat wrap on it just for extra precaution and to protect components because you never know, a little bit of extra heat can cause a lot of damage. Like I told you earlier, downpipe comes out from the bottom. Even then, it's very hard to get out, to be very careful. So that is it, factory downpipe out. Come over, Ed. So on this one now, you've got these lines that's in the way here. Now, I can get it past it, but what happens is, because it's so fragile, the rubber lines, the edge of the downpipe catches it and cuts it, it just cause extra damage and headache for no reason. So now I'm gonna see if I can move this stuff out of the way. If not, I'm gonna try and get it out the top because you can get it out the top as well. Done it that way as well. But let's see, whichever way is the safest for the vehicle, we're gonna do that. As I showed you earlier, this side is even more difficult than that side, which is already difficult. So what we have to do is my lovely assistant Jack here. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Jack gave me a hand. So what we done was we loosened off the pipes that I showed you earlier. We loosened them off all the way up and Jack pulled them down slightly to make more space. I've shimmied it past it and now, hopefully, very slowly and gently, this one's gonna come out as well. Now, Ed said earlier, oh, that was so easy. It's not, it's not easy. <laughs> you gotta be careful and take your time. It looks easy on camera, but it is not easy. There's so many variables and Stuff like an expensive carbon disc, it makes your life hell. Not well, like that. The Other way. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Booyah. Well done. Right, so as you saw, that was even more difficult than the other side. <sighs> but it is out. Right, so we've just collected our new exhaust. As you can see, this is the back box. It's got the Cerakote co uh, coating on it. And what this is good for is for heat resistance. And here are the down pipes. They've got the same coating, but we've also wrapped them in our titanium heat shielding. So what this will do is keep all the heat in. And uh, one very important thing is to not get fingerprints on these down pipes or like oils from your skin on them. Because what can happen is it can concentrate heat and cause problems on the materials. So that's that. These are ready now. So we're gonna do the final install. I've just taken off the exhaust tips off the stock back box. Gonna put them on. 
and then we're gonna start aligning stuff up and putting it on. I labeled them front left rear left so that is pre-cat that is post-cat they both have a job so let's say right we're gonna do a demonstration this is the cat right that is the pre-cat lambda that is the post-cat lambda this reads the air before it goes into the catalytic converter and this reads the air after why to see the difference to see how efficient the cat is and then it can adjust the fueling now, if it has a problem, then it can give you engine light. That's what they do. They control the fueling and they control the systems. Lambda's going in. And then once that's in, I'll tighten that up. All the way. And then it's going to plug onto this one. Yeah, goes in there. And then we plug that out of the way. We've put the exhaust on. The Lambda sensors are in. Everything's nice and tight. So it's ready for the first start. We're going to start it up. And we're going to let you hear it and let me know how you think it sounds. Hi guys, we've got um, Oli here from Ionasia. We found a problem with one of our customers where there was a aftermarket tracker fitted which was fitted on the car illegally a customer called me up regarding the issue right, that he was having on his phone where the reception wasn't wasn't uh, going up on his phone and the, the radio so then i called Oli, which is a security specialist and he found out that there was a tracker fitted to the car Oli, can you explain how it worked out and how you solved the problem. 100% Bruce, so immediately you called us, we come straight down as we always do with my team. We fired up the Oscar Green here in the CPM 700 and we carried out a full and comprehensive scan of the, Lam uh, of the Lamborghini. Yeah. And from that, what we found was not only a tracker located on the back of the vehicle, but we also found a listening device underneath the carpets in the seat well, which was clearly recording what the client was saying inside that vehicle, breaching his privacy. So we removed that device. We're currently investigating where that source has come from, wow. but we've given him peace of mind and we've solved the issue in the short term. So okay. huge success there, but fantastic work by your team in flagging this up and bringing this in quickly. Fantastic. How much is this machine worth? These machines range anywhere from £35,000 up to £50,000. And then we've got a CPM 700, a couple of grand's worth of gear. So we have all the latest equipment to allow us to do a comprehensive search, not only on vehicles, but on homes and businesses and law firms, football clubs and other places where, where clients are real vulnerable from the information, the conversations they have. So, you know, it's, it, it carries a multitude of different environments. So it's a, an incredibly comprehensive piece of kit. Fantastic. So obviously you have to be fully trained to operate this machine, right? 100%. Yeah. So, the, you know, our operators uh, go to the US yeah. and get specifically trained on this equipment. They, they, they tend refresher courses regularly, and these machines are calibrated, so we're out there regularly, making sure we're completely compliant, and we're doing all the things we can do to keep our clients safe and reassured. Fantastic. Oli, can you show us a demo on how you would scan the car? Of course I can. So over here we have a classic Audi, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. Now, what we would do here in terms of the vehicle, now 70% of our work is going to be a physical search of the car. And we look at the back near the bumpers where people would ultimately secrete what is going to be a relatively decent chunky device with a bit of big magnet underneath the car. But not forgetting people have got Apple iTags these days. There are many different devices out there, but we'll conduct a thorough sweep across the vehicle from front to back, including within the footwells. Remembering iPhones and smartphones and iPads can also be used as tracking devices, listening devices, there's an array of kits. Anything which is foreign to the car, we'll identify and we'll remove. Oli, what type of clients do you have regarding these issues? It's a good question. So we have a myriad of different clients from sort of ultra high net worth individuals who've been really successful in business to footballers, people who've got public profiles, 
you know, sporting personalities, news personalities, anybody that generally has some level of risk or exposure out there that they're worried about, a level of paranoia, a level of privacy that they're seeking. So to be honest, there's a huge bandwidth of different yeah. clients that we service at Ion Asia. Wow, wow. What are the price ranges? It's a very good question and one we get all the time. So, you know, like you've got cars vary in size and shape and when we're needed and what the problems are, like houses do and offices do. So that very much changes per client. But what I will say is when clients contact us, we put together a really bespoke package which suits them. So cost is a hard one to answer in terms of yeah. wanting to know exactly what the client's needs are and equally the scale, because we could be traveling across the world doing this work, which we do. So yeah. that's a good one. And I'd encourage people to call GVE, yeah. call us in and let's quote them up. Fantastic. Just one last question. How long have you been in this trade? Listen, I've been, in invest I've been in the investigation <laughs> sector now for nearly 20 years. Wow. You know, I started my career off as a police officer out in Australia. I moved back to London over five years ago where I've been working with Ion Asia now, supporting clients right across the world with their security risk investigations and intelligence advisory. Great. So we've been around a long time. Fantastic specialists like Ron behind me here doing the TC TSCM on this Audi. Mm. So, you know, lots of great people around me. Here we are. What we have here on the, the uh, driver's seat is the Oscar Green. Uh, very sophisticated equipment. Right, right now, if you look on its screen, we have here it registering a lot of peak levels of RF transmissions, okay, which indicates three possible threats. One is the uh, hidden devices, for example, uh, pinhole cameras or even listening devices. But most importantly is the GPS tracker. Okay, this is a CPM 700 Deluxe and how it's used is basically we sweep this across its exterior and interior and how we discover a threat, it gives me a very loud and uncomfortable beep in the ear uh, telling me, oops, we got a problem. Okay, so how we do this, we hold it approximately six inches away from the vehicle and we do the complete exterior. And this is very convenient because we do not need to actually remove any panelings or uh, 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 disturb the beauty of the car physically. We can do everything from the outside, okay, like so. I'm getting a, 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 a slight beep now, but it's just basically, uh, I can tell that it's just probably either a piece of copper or just a piece of metal, but it is not a listening device. This is what I hear. Okay. There are many different settings where you'll find these advanced devices, both in a residential setting, in your home potentially, and in a commercial setting. Let me give you a scenario that happened very last year, which was very real for one business owner. She was worried that people were listening in her conversations, sensitive business decisions were being made, and she was worried how it was getting back to staff. She called us in, we activated the equipment, and what did we find? Well, we found some of the most advanced technology recording her conversations, a converted coffee cup and an Apple iPhone charger which sat on her desk, which had always been there, but which had been changed out for one that recorded audio and video. This equipment is becoming so advanced that without these sorts of devices, you won't identify the source without them. So this is a segment in the podcast where we do a quick fire round. Okay, cool. Um, what is the one bizarre talent that you have that nobody knows about you? I can curl my tongue all the way around 360. Can we get this on camera? <laughs> <laughs> this, all the ladies are going to be loving this. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to do it for us? Oh my God. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> Most valuable piece of advice that you've received? Never give up. Favourite way to unwind after work? I, I guess quite often for me, I actually do it in the gym. Okay. Yeah, I normally train, especially if I've had a real stressful day, I just get in the gym and not necessarily lift weights, but sometimes just, you know, treadmill or whatever, just smash it out for an hour or even half an hour if I don't feel like it. It normally clears my mind. Okay. Um, what's the most challenging decision that you've had to make in business? Uh, whether to start another one or not, probably. Okay. Um, you know, is one enough? Do you want two? Do you want three or do you want four? Yeah, but I think every time you start one up, you, it's quite a challenging sort of process, really. One thing that you can't live without? Cigars. 
Oh really? Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. That's Arnold yeah. uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, like, yeah. Right, I'm a I'm a I, don't, I, t- I try not to smoke yeah. uh, too much, but uh, Cuban cigars. I'm a big fan. Yeah, Cahibas. Yes. Uh, yeah, Cahibas. I they're, they're all sort of mixed. I've got uh, I don't know. I've got. I've just been to. I've just got back from um, Barbados. Oh, Sorry, no, I haven't. Bahamas. Bahamas. Um, and I went to Dominican Republic as well. Not long after that, so I just bought a load of cigars back from there. Are um, they a lot cheaper out there? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 Prices here now, they're sort of like nearly eighty pounds each for those ones that you bought. Yeah, yeah. Really? And, and like how much did you there, buy like them? Twelve quid each or something out there because it's you know tobacco tax in the UK. I still need to perfect the art of smoking a cigar. It's not it's not for everyone. Yeah, and you got to pick the right ones. It's yeah. quite there's a lot to know with cigar smoking. Yeah, more than what people realise. Yeah, um, and the map people go, oh, I've had one horrible, but what did you have? You know, what did you drink with it? Um, See, I don't find them horrible. I, I find them yeah, nice, nice, right? And uh, especially like you're saying, when you get a smooth one, it's just perfect, yeah, it's perfect. Right? And it, however, it depends how they're wrapped as well can make okay. a difference. The the one thing that gets me every every time I smoke, I smoke a cigar is the next morning, like my lungs are hurting. Yeah, yeah. So it's, and everybody's like, no, that's not meant to happen. You yeah. should. You've yeah, been sure. It. I yeah, don't yeah, get that, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so you probably have a rough one. Yeah. <laughs> Which do you prefer, uh, office work or being on the front line? Um, I'm all right with both, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm all right with both. A lot of my time now is in the office anyway, mm. um, which I think when you get older as well, you, maybe that suits a little bit better. But depending on what the front line is, I guess. Mm. Favourite country to work in and why? Favourite country to work in, for me, certainly in the security days, it depended on the job more than the country. So I, I, I worked in Brazil in the World Cup 2012, oh, wow. was it, I think. Um, I was out there for a couple of months then. Yeah. Um, was that a- anyway? Was that good? Yeah, it's good fun. It's good fun. It's a nice country to work in. I've mm. been there a few times, but it's a nice country to work in. So, yeah, for me, in terms of working in these countries, because obviously I've been to a lot of countries with work, um, it, it could be the nicest country ever, but if you've got a horrible job, then it kind of ruins it. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends on the job for the country, really. But South America's nice. South America. Okay, and then what is the one bit of advice that you'll give to your younger self? I should have had a lot more confidence and belief in myself at a lot earlier age. It wasn't until I got quite a bit older mm. that I realised what I was probably capable of doing. I think a lot of people are guilty of that, right? Yeah, I think you, you look at other people and you see what they're doing and it's kind of, mm. it's what other people are doing, it's what they're doing. Although you like the idea of doing it, you never, certainly you know, when you're even as young as 12, 13 years old, um, when you're really young, sometimes you're, you'll say, I'm going to do that because you... Just because you know you, you don't really think about the process of getting to do that, you just say it. But as you get older, you start realizing more about the things you've got to do to get to those places, yeah. so you kind of don't think it's going to be you, yeah, yeah, yeah. because um, all the doubts creep because in. all it is all starts or, up, yeah. You start listening to other people, yeah, they, how have they got there? And, and is, is, it may be a hundred people where that person is, and they've all got there a different way, yeah. But you listen to that one person, and how have they got there, and you go, Oh, well, I, I'm not gonna be able to do that, which yeah. you might not be able to, but then there's another 99 different ways you could, could have got there as well, there really is. That's good advice. Um, thank you for coming on our podcast. Appreciate it. And it was fun learning about your history and what you've been through and some crazy stories as well. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Hope you liked this podcast. If you did, please like, subscribe and share. And also, please make sure that you click on the notifications button. Until next time, see you later. <laughs>